bearest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. 18. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. I think I wanted to focus on uh, 16 and 17. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Amen. So today we are bringing sacrifices of a broken and contrite spirit. Are we willing? Are we willing to be broken before the Lord? Not to just offer our
Sometimes when we read through the word, you know, sometimes I read through, I try to read through complete books, like I'm going through the book of John. It's a difficult book, but also it has a lot of hope. Praise the Lord. Even if you're going through difficult times, the book of John offers a lot of hope. Yeah. He keeps on pleading that I have a witness in heaven that will speak to my father on behalf. Hallelujah, because he was being falsely accused by his friends. He said, I have a witness in heaven. So all of us have a witness through Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So today we're going to look at the seven benefits of knowing the glory of God in his name. Praise the Lord. The seven benefits of knowing the glory of God in his name. I think I shared this new year briefly. When we fasted for seven days, we were asking the Lord for three things. Number one, we are asking the Lord that he will teach us his ways. The second thing we prayed was, the Lord will teach us what? The manifest presence in his life. Like Moses cried out, Father, if your presence does not go with us, we don't want to go. Um, on Friday, we had a debriefing in the office, and during the Tuesday prayer meeting, yeah, of course, that was, Steve was sharing how the Lord challenged him on that scripture, where... The Lord just put in his spirit, the children of Israel, some of them wanted to go to the promised land without the Lord. If you read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I remember Moses told them, let them go. But they were totally chased down from the mountain. <laughs> yeah, you cannot go even your promised land without the Lord. The promised land is his promised land. Brothers, if you are. Yeah, we really need to pray that the manifest presence will always be with us. Then the other thing Moses cried out was, Lord, show me your glory. And so I want to speak that part. We'll read together. It says in Exodus chapter 34, verse 4 to 8, it says, So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets, like the first ones, and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets. Then the Lord came in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children, their children, for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshipped. Hallelujah. Now when the Lord came to Moses, the Lord, he had cried out to the Lord in Exodus 33, the Lord show me your glory. 
So the Lord told him how it will happen. You'll go to the mountain, I'll place you on my rock, and I'll pass in front of you and declare my name. And that's exactly what the Lord fulfilled the next event when Moses went to the mountain to replace the tablets. The Lord used that opportunity to come and meet him. It's interesting when the Lord came, he proclaimed his name in the third person. He did not say, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. He said, the Lord there? Eh? Yeah. Because I believe Moses had experienced that one before when the Lord called him, when the Lord came and proclaimed his name. I'm Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now he fills into this name the details of what that name carries. And this encounter was so strong that Moses fell down and worshipped. Hallelujah. We are going to see what this means. What does compassion mean? Okay. So I've done some studies in classical Hebrew, so I'll teach you some classical Hebrew. Compassion means the chief passion a human being carries. Okay? It's the best of passions. It's the person in the chamber of water. When a mother is carrying a baby in the womb, it's called compassion. And the word means to cradle in one's arms to protect. The picture is taken from a house surrounded by a wall. Okay. A refuge functions as a place of hiding from any undesirable person or situation. So this picture shows us God has compassion means God places a wall around us. And it's the most powerful emotion that the Father carries. And I know because of the situations you are going through, sometimes it's very hard to believe God. God, if, why not crumbling me and covering me? But we're going to see one of the benefits why God allows us to go through difficult times. It's because he cares for us. Hallelujah. Yeah, we're going to see the benefit that was to John, okay? Another thing he proclaimed was a most, the most gracious one, okay? That grace means providing a rescue and help to another in distress. And actually the direct translation of grace in classical Hebrew is beauty. Grace is the beautiful part of God. Hallelujah. It's the beautiful part. Because he is able to rescue and help people in distress. If you read the Bible, you can see again and again, whenever people cry out to the Lord, the Lord will come to their rescue. The children of Israel. He told Moses, I have heard their cry. I have seen their pain. I have come down. Now go. Let's go and help our people. When uh, Abraham cried out for Lord, the Lord came down personally to come and rescue Lord from Sodom and Gomorrah. We are going to see that be a prayer when you come to the New Testament. There's a prayer when you make, the Lord will stop everything. We're going to pray, that's what you're going to pray today. There's a prayer when you make, the Lord will stop everything. Hallelujah. Then slow to anger means he is long suffering and patient. The Lord does not rejoice to see people experiencing judgment. <coughs> Bible says in Peter, he's slow to anger that many may come what? To the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So sometimes we humans, especially when we have difficult situations and people have really annoyed us and upset us, it is so tempting to call fire from heaven upon people. That is not the character of God. The, Lord, the Bible says God what? is slow to anger. No, I always say that phrase is, is repeated in the New Testament many times. He is slow to anger, but it doesn't mean he doesn't get angry. The only difference is he gets slow to anger compared to human beings. His anger is slow. We always say when it reaches fullness, you will not escape. Hallelujah. Just look at the Babylon, how he judged Babylon. After 70 years, he told Israel, after 70 years, I'll come for Babylon. And right on time, he raised up King Cyrus to go and bring judgment on. Babylon. And then Persia also rose up. God raised up Alexander the Great. He went for them. Every time an empire rose up against his people, the Lord will give them time. The longest time he ever gave, do you know in the Bible, he told Abraham in Genesis 15 that your people will be what? Slaves in a foreign land. They'll stay there what? For 400 years. Because their sin has not come what? To fullness. But when it comes, I will rescue my people and they'll not leave Egypt empty handed. Do you know it took how many years? 400 years. And God added, added what? 30 years just for grace. The Bible says on the 430th year to the day 
when he told Abraham, the Lord came for Egypt. So the Lord is patient even for the Gentiles. Praise the Lord. Yeah, sometimes we need to be, we're going to see the application. Abounding in love, I put the word love in bold because love means the Father revealed it. That's the direct translation of love. In Hebrew, it is the father's responsibility to reveal love to his children. Love does not come from the mother. Please, not in classical Hebrew. And even the Bible is very careful in the New Testament. The Bible says what? Husband love? And the wife is supposed to do what? Respect. That's the only thing God requires. Everything else you are trying to put on, you know, I tell people, be very careful when you replace God with the things he has never said. Praise the Lord. I always tell people when you do marriage counseling, women were not created to give love. They were created to receive love. That's all. That's what I like from Eric Prince. You know, those books you teach, teach until you get it. So, the same thing, children are created one, to receive love from the Father. Fathers, we are responsible to reveal the Father's love to the children. Many children get offended with God because of the way the Father has treated them. Not because of the mother. And normally when they don't deal with those issues, one manifestation of anger, because anger means without love in classical Hebrew. When children grow out without love, they become angry, especially against the fathers. God says what? Abounding in love. The Father is abounding in love. I don't like that translation, by the way, because I think you cannot say God is abounding in love, because what, what happens the day is empty. So I think the translation should be, God is full of love. There's no, no day he wakes up, he doesn't have love. There's no day. And when you read the Bible, it takes time for God to judge people. That's why I like the Bible, not just reading through like Jeremiah. How many times you want Jeremiah preached for almost 70 years? 70 years. Warning Israel, our judgment is coming, but they will not listen. After that, the Lord said, okay, enough. I have to deal with this thing because of my justice. So God takes time. Okay, we're going to see the application. Then he says, about in what? In faithfulness. There's a scripture I like in Proverbs that says, who, who can find a faithful man? You know that scripture? He never said, who can find a faithful woman? Because also faithfulness now reveals the motherly part of God. Because the direct translation means stability, steadiness, truly, trusty, dependable. The word a man means faithful, always there, the life of a mother. A mother means someone who's always dependable. That the children can know no matter what happens, my mother will be there. So today's not even a healing. Eh? <laughs> so I'm not going to make an altar call, just take it. When you are called to be a mother, your children depend on you if that's the part God has given to mothers, that you should be there no matter what the cost, just tell you. Okay? That's what means faithful. I said the, the life the life translation is the life of a mother. It's the same word. Used for faithfulness. The life of a mother in a family. Okay? Continuity and stability. Praise the Lord. Then he says maintaining love too. Thousands. This one I like it. When I say this phrase, I always say, Father, I'm there. I've experienced your love. Those thousands you're going to experience your love in this earth. Lord, I am there. And I thank you for it. That I've been able to experience God's love. Then he says forgiving. He says he forgives three what? Three things. Wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And I always say God knows English. Eh? So those words don't mean the same. Sin, God can forgive easily. Rebellion? Will his anger set up? And King Saul. That one, the Lord will time you. <laughs> but wickedness, you really have to cry out to him. It's not easy God to forgive wicked people. But the Bible says still he can. And we have examples. He forgave King Manasseh, who lived for 55 years. He killed so many people in Jerusalem. The Bible says blood was flowing like a river. <laughs> but Manasseh repented. You know, he's in heaven. Manasseh is in heaven, my friend. After killing so many people, one day he cried before he died. Another king that was horrible was who? King Ahab. The Bible says he cried out, the Lord forgave him, he fasted. The guy is in heaven. The guy was so wicked, he became a saying in Israel. God will say, I don't want to be like King Ahab. But well, the day he cried out of wickedness, the Lord said, okay, you have touched my heart. Another wicked king was who? Nebuchadnezzar. He is in heaven. 
He made it. If Nebuchadnezzar can made it, you will make it. Because those days, kings were, who, were not even rulers, they were gods. They had to be worshipped. But in his suffering, he proclaimed in Daniel chapter 4, declaring the God of heaven, the God of Daniel shall be our God, and made a decree. Everyone shall worship this God. And that's how Nebuchadnezzar departed the world. King Cyrus, God says, my righteous servant, he is in heaven. Tell your neighbor there is hope. I heard a man of God say many years ago, he used to say, if Samson made it, my friend, you can make it. <laughs> Samson made it. He barely made it. Barely. How did he make it? On the last day, he cried out to God, just give me one more strength to fulfill. Samson fulfilled his mandate that God had been trying to train him for all his life in one day. And actually in one crime. Because Samson was called to destroy the Philistines. He failed to do it, but when he was captured as a prisoner, he did what? He cried out to God, and God eliminated the Philistines. He gave Israel a break. So what I'm trying to say, this path, okay, forgiveness means what? Let's go there, because I trust too. It means to continue to hold. The word is for forgiveness. In Israel, they'll take a, a flag. Eh? Every tribe had a flag. They'll do like this, and the flag will have become a standard. That's the direct word for forgiveness. It means to lift up a standard. It means to lift up a burden that someone is carrying. That's what it says, God said, Jesus said, forgive us our debts, as forgive other, those who have. Okay. You cannot forgive your debt if you don't forgive others. Jesus said it. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others. So lift up the barriers and the burdens of other people. The Lord says, I will live for you also. And also he says, blessed be, merciful. Then I will show you what. Yes. The initiative is from who? God or us? Us. Okay? So forgiveness, when God lifts the burden of sin, he carries it. That means he raises up a standard. So, we go very quickly because we have the notes. Number one, what are the seven benefits of the glory of God in his name? Because he was proclaiming his name when Moses had this encounter. The first thing, he teaches us how God deals with these people. Psalm 78, you realize what Moses was shown is repeated in the whole Bible. And for me, it was surprising because I realized there are two kinds of prayers in the Bible. There are prayers you, you address God's character and there are prayers you address God's hand. And I know most of us like the hand. All of us want to see the miracles and the power. And it's the Bible, it's allowed. Like when God rescues you from our enemies, that is the power of his heart. But this one, when you address God on his character, he gets very emotional. He always answers. Hallelujah. So he says, the first benefit, he teaches how God deals with his people. Psalm 78, 36, 38 says, but then they would flatter him with their words. Sometimes we flatter God with our words. And we lie even to him with our tongues. Okay? Their hearts are not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet he was what? Merciful. And he forgave their iniquities. And he did not destroy them. Time after time, he restrained his anger and did not stop his full wrath. The Lord is talking about Israel when they were walking from Egypt to the promised land. And he ends up, Psalm 78 ends up when God said, God got so tired in Psalm 78, he said, he went to look. That's the scripture say that even the tribe of Ephraim, in the day of battle, they refused to fight. So the Lord judged them. So God said, I'll go look for another tribe. He went and looked for Judah. And says, from Judah, I picked up David, a man after my own heart. That's when they were able to enter the place of rest. If you read Psalm 78, it's a good scripture to really meditate. Okay? Because he took a process, not because God was slow. God was merciful because again and again, from the time of they left Egypt to uh, David, uh, King Solomon, when King Solomon took over, the Bible says it was 480 years. It took a long time to rest the God's people, not because God was slow, but because of their sinfulness and their wickedness. God had told Israel, if you obey me, I'll take you from Egypt to the promised land in how many days? 11 days. But because, so what I'm trying to say, these are pictures of our journey with the Lord. When things are slow in your life, it's rarely on God's side. It's us. He says, many times they'll tell him, we love you, we love you. But their hearts were very far. But he was merciful. He says he was merciful. He forgave the iniquities and did not destroy them. We see, 
There's something you need to understand. Maybe those who are in perspectives class will understand. Uh, when you reach the book of Revelation, I'm really praying you reach the book of Revelation. And maybe the next chapter you're going to do the third book on the mysteries of the kingdom. That one, if you don't get changed, me, I don't know where you, where you never, if you don't change that chapter, that book, you need mercy. <laughs> because this guy was shown mysteries that are very difficult for that church to understand. Why the Lord is determined to keep human beings on the earth is to prove Satan wrong. From the beginning, Satan wants to make sure he destroys everything to show God that he's powerful. But in the book of Revelation, even in the chaos of the three and a half years, the Lord will still have a people. Satan can never win this battle. Yeah. And actually, it will be the greatest manifestation of the power of God the world has ever seen. It will happen in those three and a half years. The Satan will be running everywhere. You know, this idea of teaching people will be running away from Satan, it depends which Christian are you. If you are the outer court Christian, you'll be running for your life. If you are at the church, you'll be hidden in the wilderness. If there were cameras, they'd be chasing Satan. So choose. Tell your neighbor, choose. choose. Yeah, please. Me, I'm not in your tribe. I'm not the tribe at least of being chased. Me, at least, I either be in the wilderness or I'll be the one chasing Satan. The book of Revelation is very clear. The sons of God are going to mess up Satan's kingdom. They'll be so successful, Jesus will come from heaven with power. Why? Because the bride has proved a point. You cannot win the battle. Jesus won it on the cross, by the way. Satan can never improve on it. Jesus wants now the church to win the battle. So he'll raise up this tribe, the sons of God, the manifestation of his power. These people will be unique. So don't worry. We always say, there's another thing you find in the history of God's people. Satan is always starting out trouble to destroy Israel. You understand? God will never allow it. The Jewish people will outlast Satan. Because his plan is to stop everything. So I'm trying to illustrate the way he treated people in Psalm 17 is the way God deals with us. By the way, even if you flatter God, you're not the first one to flatter God. You know, flattering God. God, you're very nice. God, you've been gracious to me. I will love you forever. And then you wake up no morning, you beat your wife. <laughs> the Lord says, What? I thought you love me forever. <laughs> Or now you scream at your children. You know, there's nothing that shocks God. Actually, I think our generation, okay, I know what is happening in society, lesbianism is coming up. You know, it has been there since from the beginning. The Genesis, God has seen those problems and he knows how to deal with them. And he deals with them the same way. Or people mocking God, he has seen many like Pharaoh, who cried out to God, who is this God who I should release his people? If you read uh, Exodus 5, that one really annoyed God. When he said, who is this God that I should release these people? That's said the Lord told Moses, I'm coming down now, for sure now. By the time he finished, he's lost his first more than everyone. You never challenge God because you never win. You know, Christians challenge God. Sinners, sinners greet. But I've seen Christians say, Munga Taniona. The Lord is just smiling. You know those times you treat them God. God, I will not give my tithes. I will not give you a test and see how we will God will survive. We will survive. <laughs> or you say, God, I'll never give to the poor. God says, okay, I'll still supply the poor and give for you and make you eat their portion. Or you say, tell God, I'll go and take one land from the widows and the offers the way our tribes do. When widows and offers, instead of being held, we go take their land. The Lord says, hallelujah, now I'm coming for you. You'll also become a widow. And it's in the Bible. God told Babylon, you have made Israel a widow. I'll make you a widow in a day. There's a scripture like that. We only say, keep silent. Babylon was saying, I'm the queen of the world. I'll make Israel to suffer. I'll take away her children, the Lord I'll have. The Lord says, in one day. Do you know God did in one day? Babylon fell in a day. King Cyrus entered the city through the water system, killed Nebuchadnezzar, his grandson Belshazzar, in a day. Because the guy said, I'll also destroy God's people in a day. God said, we will see. Never threaten God. Tell your neighbor, hey, it's a negative direction. God just starts smiling. Yeah, sometimes we can be proud. Pride is a manifestation we are mocking God. Okay? So there's nothing that surprises the Lord. Our iniquities, you know, don't think your iniquities are difficult. God says, I forgive their iniquities. So you as a small, iniquities are family sins. Eh? And God says, that one I've forgiven before. Just bring repentance. Then he says, the second thing, he teaches us to appeal to God's character in prayer. Numbers 14, 17, 23. 
Now, this, this story is based on Numbers 12, where God told Moses, send spies to see the land and bring a report. So he chose 12 guys. Ten of them brought a bad report. Two of them brought a good report. Because of the ten, the ten, the bad report, people started shaking. Actually, the Bible says Israel cried the whole night. Imagine telling God, why do you want to kill us? Did God want to kill them? It's the report that they received. They misinterpreted the report. You know, all of us can see the promised land. Please listen to me. Caleb and Joshua and the ten spies saw the same thing, but the interpretation was wrong. All of them even carried the fruit on their shoulders and brought that this land is fruitful. So they came and told Moses, actually, the land is very fruitful, but, but, maybe are the grasshoppers. So, you know, if you, I like the book of Numbers, eh, because that's how Christians will behave. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, they think that the sins they committed, we commit them. God was like, wow, I gave these people to go and check my land. They have brought a bad report to my people. Do you know God started waking up slowly from the throne? Yeah, and then he said, let me go and hear myself. And he found people crying the whole night. Do you know the Bible says he came in a cloud? The Lord left heaven. I want to hear what is happening. I know the Lord was so annoying then that this thing I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You guys, now you don't want to enter. And then they told God, they started telling God, you remember the watermelons in Egypt, and the onions, and the garlic. And then they told him, even Egypt, God, Egypt had a better graves than here. They told him like that. God, we don't want to die here. Take us to Egypt to die in Egypt. What the Lord told them? There's a scripture in Numbers 13 says, according to your word, I will do what you have said. You will die in this place. Now what happened? Moses went and cried to the Lord because this was a very challenging situation that most God came to Moses in the cloud and told him, you know what? I have a very nice solution. Let us wipe up all these people and let me create a new nation from you. He told Moses like that. And Moses said, wait a minute. That's how Moses started praying. So can you pray the prayer? He told the Lord, my, he, told, he told the Lord, my, may the Lord's strength be displayed. Just as you have declared, the Lord is what? Slow to anger, abounding in love, forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty and punished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Then Moses told the Lord, in accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people. Just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. Verse 20, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them. Moses appealed to his character. He told God, you told me yourself you are a forgiving God. So I want to see whether you forgive these people. Do you know the Lord was boiling? Do you know when God gets angry? In anger in the Bible. Anger means breathing from the nose. <laughs> when God starts breathing from his nose, if I was you, start running. Because what happened in the book of Numbers when God was angry, even before when they were hiding here, fire would break out from the outskirts, start eating people. It was very funny. For 40 years, people, the other day, 70,000 died because of the sin of what? Uh, Amoabites. Okay. These people died. There's the sin of Meribah. There's the sin of what? Every time they have a problem, fire will just break out. Moses will tell Aaron, take the incense and run and put it between the people and the judgment, then it will stop. So that was their habit for 40 years. Me, I'm happy I'm living in the New Testament because I don't think most of us will have survived. <laughs> Paul says the five sins they committed, the church still commits idolatry, testing God. God will just wake up and say, hey, we are not going to discuss. So it is good to appeal what? to God's character. Then the Lord told him, verse 21, Nevertheless, as sure as I live and as sure as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and thy signs are performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me what? Ten, ten times. Do you know it's possible? Actually, if you come, they tested God ten times. Okay. Ten in the interpretation of dreams means testing. Testing God. Not one of them will ever see the land I promise on all to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with content will ever see. So that day God made a ruling. You know, he had to wipe out how many people? Three million people. And God gave him time. So when the Lord declared judgment, they began afresh. They started dying in the wilderness. 
God says, none of them. And do you know by the end of the day, none of them. Only their children, three million children. That's why they need to do a second census. All the three million people died, only to survive. I always tell people, I'm happy about this scripture. The Lord says, I have forgiven them. Do you know all those people in heaven? They made it, but they never entered their promised land. Many Christians die without entering the promised land. Salvation is free, but inheriting the promised land, you have to pay a price. Salvation is free. These three million entered. Only Caleb and Joshua what? Are in heaven and they enter the promised land. Others, their children took over the inheritance. Okay? But let me, I always tell this in inner healing. Don't, I don't like these prophecies that what I did not do in your life, I do in your children. This is a very good example because they refuse to enter the promised land, the children enter. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you, fight for your promises. Number three, the another benefit of knowing the glory of God in his name is it motivates us to repent of sin and turn to God in faith. This is how we get said in Romans 2, verse 4, it says, Or oh, you shall contend for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing God's kindness is intended what? To lead you to repentance. The goodness of God in our lives is supposed to lead us closer to him. Do not take advantage of God's goodness. Okay? Hallelujah. I'm not, I'm not explaining that one, okay? Hosea 2, 19, 23. He says, I'll betroth you to me forever. I'll betroth you what? In righteousness and justice and in love and compassion. I'll betroth you in faithfulness and you'll acknowledge me. He's repeating the same thing he told Moses. Salvation is based on God's character. Okay? Then he says, in that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the skies, and they will respond to the earth. And the earth will respond to the grain, the new one and the olive oil, and they will respond to Jezreel. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I call not my loved one. I will say to those not my people, you are what? My people, and they say you are my God. Now this one is talking about, up to verse 23, where he says, I'll plant her in the land, land that's Israel. After that, he's talking about Gentiles. Peter says, Gentiles are the ones not loved by God became what? Loved by God. Because of his mercy, he says what? Faithfulness, love, and mercy and compassion. God says, I will also bring the Gentiles in my covenant, okay? Jeremiah 18, 7 to 8 says, If at that time I announce that a nation or kingdom is uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I want repents of its evil, then I will do what? I will relent. I will be slow to anger and not inflict the disaster I have planned. Repentance is very important to the Lord. That is the only thing that stops God to act his judgment. And his judgment is blessed on what? On his righteous system. His name, his character, and his word. God does not judge us according to our feelings. All of us have learned about God's of heaven, okay? So you understand, everything is about what? His justice. It's not about you. So he says, if I proclaim disaster on a nation, then they repent. And normally I change it quickly. So you see Joel, Joel gives us the same, a good example. He says, even now, verse 12, Joel 2, 12, 14, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your hearts, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for his words gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents what? From sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and what? Leave what? Behind a blessing. Great offerings, drink offerings for the Lord your God. Now, Joel is a book that talks about the preparation for the church for the Pentecost. Okay? Okay? Hallelujah. So this is my understanding. Before the Lord had to pour out his spirit on the church, the church had to go through what? Repentance through the death of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died, he paid the price that the Lord can send the Holy Spirit on the holy people. That's what it means to me. Because Joel, Peter says Joel was fulfilling what Peter, uh, Peter said, Joel fulfilled what the Lord said. Pentecost follows Passover. It's very important to see Joel is saying, even when you are returning to God, why are you returning to? Because he's what? Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounds in love. So it changes the way we ask for repentance. Okay? You know, sometimes you can go to the Lord to pray repenting, but the Lord is wondering, what is the basis of your prayer? Okay? 
You know, tears do not move God. Some tears, not all. I'll be disclaimer, some. But if tears moved God, then uh, uh, what is his name? Esau will have gotten his blessing. He cried for it, but he never got it. The Bible is saying, why is it he was denied the blessing? He cried, but he was not repentant. Paul says clearly, do not cry to God and not repentant. And let me warn you, it's not good to go and repent and go back to the same mistake. That is not repentance. We are going to see from Jonah, when you repent, one key there is to turn from your evil ways. If you are going to get God's attention, it's not important to repent or to cry. God says, change your ways, then we can talk. Do not be caught up. Oh God, I fasted 40 days, but after 40 days you went back to the same man. The Lord is wondering, when are you going to change? Okay? Do not take advantage of his grace, compassion, love when you are praying. Make sure you focus on the right thing. Number four, knowing the glory of God in his name provides the basis of why God rescues his people from judgment. So you have two examples. This is the basis he rescued Lot and his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19, 18 to 19. Lord said to the angels, No, my lords, please, your servant has found favor in your eyes. And you have shown what? great kindness to me in sparing my life. So he was aware that he was saved because God was kind. God does not save us. You know, how many, how many, no 9-11, no 9-11. In 9-11 it happened, I remember the day, I was, I think, I was in school, I think I course in Desta. When it, no, that was 97, 97, when the bomb blasts. But, but 2001, I remember, you can remember the day where you are, when you saw those planes flying into a building. Do you know how many Christians were shown by the Lord don't go to work that day? But still some went there. They died. Hallelujah. Yeah. Those are, um, please don't tell me that God chose these ones to die. No. We only say, before you conclude those things, go back to the source. Where is it they missed God? Maybe they were not listening. Okay. And I know of a man of God, Robert Henderson, he was shown by the Lord why 9 11 happened. He was shown, he went to the courts of heaven, and the Lord told him there's a particular demon in the sea that the Satanists wanted to activate. <laughs> you know, they always want the world government, they always want these things. So when they activated it, they, the Lord told him the church did not come to me quickly, so I allowed it to happen. Yeah. If you buy his teachings on the details of the course of heaven, he gives many stories. 9-11, he gives Colorado, and he was sent to Colorado as uh, an apostle from another state. He goes to Colorado, and he's in the courts of heaven with these South African seers. The Lord tells him, you know, he's trying to appeal to solve some problems in that state. The, the, the dragon, the principality in Colorado, came and told him, and the city and the state told him, who are you? Why are you here? You know, the only thing he could appeal, he told God, I'm here because I've been sent by the Father in heaven. And then he was able to deal with that situation and stop what? What the enemy was planning to do in Colorado. What I'm trying to say to the beneficiaries, like Lord, they never knew someone stood in the car. Lord never knew you, Abraham, and you pray, my friend. Hallelujah. So people can experience your kindness because of your intercession. This guy just got an angelic visitation from the Lord. Tell him, get and pack your things very quickly. <laughs> and they, the fiancé refused that. Remember the fiancé? He went to the boyfriends of the debtors. They said, told him, no, 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 you go. Do you know that Christians like condemning what? Lot. No, Lot is not a good story. Until you read the book of what? Peter. Bible says, Lot was a righteous man. Tell your neighbor, Lot was a righteous man. So don't preach against him. I remember Greek John went to heaven and the Lord told him, the Lord told Rick Joyner, if the church could preach the gospel the way the Lord preached in Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll bring revival in the nations. Do you know that? The Lord told him he was a righteous man and he preached. He preached to Sodom. He was not enjoying the fun in Sodom and Gomorrah. He preached to them. Hallelujah. And other people you like complaining is Jonah. We're going to see Jonah. Jonah had a revelation of God. The church has no clue up to today. Do you know anyone who was put in the Bible as a righteous man? My friend, they qualified. I pray you qualify. Yeah. For those people, even Samson with these problems, he's the he's the hall of faith. You know, it's the hall of faith. He's in the list. I will say Samson. Samson made it, my friend. I have to make it. 
The guy had many problems. <laughs> but do you know what caught God's attention? The Bible says, I faith. Samson's faith activated a miracle in Israel. So don't rush to judge. Uh, I've had people preach about Hagar. You know Hagar? Hagar, is a, if you listen to T.D. Jakes, he has a very powerful, powerful sermon about Hagar. It, I had that message me, I was crying. I said, hey, even Hagar knew God. No, how she know God? How many times did God visit Hagar? At least three times. When she was naming Ishmael, when she was chased away, and when she ran away, God provided food. Hagar, it was a righteous lady. Please, don't preach those message that she was taking someone's husband. Disclaimer. <laughs> Wait, it's true. Was she the one taking the car? No, sure. She was invited in the car. <laughs> Please. She was not a bad person. Okay. Men don't extrapolate from there. <laughs> no, don't invite someone in their car. That is a sin. But Hagar never knew what she was. She was just told to go and work. How she went to look for a job? Are there other things? Another person who invited the car was who? Bill Hard. They were just invited to be house guards. They became mothers. You know, Pastor, a lot of people don't like preaching those things. Me, I like seeing the Bible. The Bible is a book of drama. What? You read some things, you close your eyes, but don't say, just continue reading. And Zimba and Bill Hard did what? Gave how many sons to Jacob? Were they counted part of Jacob? Yes. Was they were their mistake? No. So I only say, all those children that are outside there, you know you're your children. Go look for them. That's the application. <laughs> Don't come to Boston and tell me, hey, I'm not going to take care of my children. You're not a good Christian. Me and but then, you guys who are new to church, when someone comes for counseling, in a healing, I'll tell them, go look for your children and pay school fees. This idea of having a limousine, <laughs> eating from Java, and you have children outside there in the village because you love one wife. Take care of the one wife. But the children, my friends, if they cry to God, the Bible says if they cry to God, God will visit you. God says he hears the cry of the poor and those in distress. So if you have children outside there, listen to me. You know yourself. Go and take care of them. Those children, you may not know they are part of your covenant. You may have made mistakes, but the children are not a mistake. Otherwise, you need to subtract Jacob from our Bible. And to subtract Abraham, if you take away Abraham, where is the father of our faith? But you know what I'm trying to stop? Christians must learn what? Love, compassion, abounding faith. Those things we need to carry when you're dealing with fellow human beings. Some of us were in problems, not because God learned it. Have you been arrested falsely? Me have been arrested falsely twice. And I was being accused of being a drug dealer. I was like, God, how am I? Because <laughs> my mistake was helping some people when I was in campus to find direction to the Saudi Arabian embassy. The next thing, the police came to me, they're a drug dealer. I pleaded mercy. I didn't call me. I didn't know how to pray those days. I was born again. The guy asked me, where to go to church? I told him I go to church, this church. Who is your pastor? Pastor Wilson of Malayo. Oh, that's your pastor. Go. <laughs> it's good to have a pastor like that. He's not. I escaped. Hey, and they told, they told me, never help Nigerians, never help Ghanaians, Senegalese, those people, even if they kneel down and their pastors, don't help them. Do you know twice, those people are believers. Those drug dealers are believers. They're in the Bible, my friend. <laughs> True story. I was caught twice. It's me, I lived in West Africa, by the way. But me, I lived there with my eyes open. I'm not like these people who see Nigerian preachers and start shouting. My friend, you have no idea what you're doing. But then people say I'm against Nigerians. I'm not. I'm saying the reality. And they know it. But then they know it. I have Nigerian friends. They know they have problems in the house. People say I'm backbiting. I'm not. Me, I tell them. <laughs> My best friend in Ghana was a Nigerian missionary. He came and told me, Adeni Yi. He told me, Pastor, if you ever come to Nigeria, make sure someone picks you at the airport in Lagos. Lagos is a dangerous city. And the guy is a Nigerian, my friend. So me, I've never gone to Nigeria. <coughs> he told me, the other day, he told me, he told me, you can go to North to Kanduga, and someone will take a bus and follow you to Lagos, just to steal. Imagine. True stories. Dr. Florence was detained there in the airport for three days. Because they wanted a bribe. 
So Nigerians, West Africa, when you're dealing with them, open your eyes, my friend. Do you love me? Yeah. Yeah, I lived among them, so I'm not backbiting. They told me themselves. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Mercy and grace to you. <laughs> yeah, you know, me, I'm just saying it's, I don't know. I don't know how they have those challenges, but we are fully delivered in Kenya, you know. And there's a pastor, Emmanuel, Pastor Emmanuel. You know, Pastor Emmanuel, one time he stayed with a Nigerian pastor. He's a Ghanaian pastor. But the time the Nigerian and the Kapagaduba, Ali Boraki Lakiki. Pastor, Ali Chukwa Bizak is all. Wake up and smell what? The coffee. Not everyone who says, I belong to the Lord is the Lord. Okay? So let's continue. Jonah, this one I like. I'm still talking about God rescues us from judgment. One benefit. Once you know the character of God in his name, he can rescue from judgment. When Jonah's warning reached the king of what? Nineveh. He rose from his throne. The king rose from the throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in what? In Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, test anything. Do not let them eat what? Or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call it urgently on God. Let them give up what? Their evil ways and violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion do what? Turn from his fierce anger so that he will not. Do you know this king was not saved? But he knew God is what? Compassionate. And he's slow to anger. To relent means to be slow to anger. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he did what? He relented and did not bring judgment, destruction. He had threatened. Hallelujah. Now look at the job, job, Jonah's reaction. <laughs> Go to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 4. He says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. This is very wrong. Do you know why he was offended? He says, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Is in this what I said? John, John on you. When I still, I was at home. That's why I tried to do it. To forestall. I knew you were going to forgive this way I ran away from my life. I was fleeing to Tashis. I knew that you are what? A gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger, abounding love, a God who relents from saving what? Calamity. Now, Lord, take my life. It is better for me to die. This guy was offended because God is compassionate. How many Christians have been there? Me have been there. When God has forgiven some of them, God, this is unfair. <laughs> or God, you have been praying something for 20 years. Someone gets in a day. He, he have not even prayed. Have you been there? Yeah, William Wood said, told us it's called what? When he touched on healing, he said, when the angel came in the hospital to heal him supernaturally. The guy was a pagan, by the way. He didn't know Christ. He didn't know the Bible. He had never gone to church. And this angel visited them and healed him completely. I told him to go and preach. So even when he was preaching to Christians, he was not that these Christians don't believe the Bible. That's how William Moon started the healing ministry. So the Lord told him, I deal with human beings in two ways, through grace and through what? Through faith. There are people who will get miracles because of grace. But there are those who will get through what? Faith. Faith means you have pursued. But some people go to just wake up and say, ah, today, today is a good day. I think the church worship very well. Then I'm going to look for someone from committee and just visit him. <laughs> That's how God visited Kate Susan. You know Kate Susan? Yes. She was a criminal, high level criminal, in a maximum prison in America. One day, Angel Michael, Angel Michael appeared to her. I know she doubted it. So she met this evangelist. Who told her, I know you have this angel who visits you always. Because she didn't know the Bible, by the way. She asked the lady, who this angel? Oh, you don't know that angel that keep, keeps people from the back. <laughs> the angel girlfriend, you don't know that. That's the work of angel Michael, to keep people from the back. <laughs> then one day she was driving, a feather dropped in her car, a big feather. The Lord told her, that is a Michael, to know that I'm around. That lady had no clue about God. She had to be disciple. But she started having visitations now from Angel Michael. After that, she made the chariots. You know the chariots? The angels that may help Elisha and Elijah, when they, they'll come and start, start asking and food will come. Those are her angels, by the way. I read that, you know, I listened to that testimony. You know, you know, there's a testimony you read, Pastor. 
Wewe wakafuta 40 years. Na wote wamepata criminal. Don't you feel you took like Jonah? <laughs> If you are honest, go on. I've been serving you. I've never seen the Jamaica. Relax. Don't be jealous because of God's character. Because he was really offended. But no one thing I like, I like this story. It really blessed me this time. Jonah says, I knew. I knew. He knew God. He knew God was gracious. He knew God was merciful. Most of us do not know that part of God. And that is the glory of God. The glory of God is not miracles, signs, and wonders. That is his hand. You need to know God, that when you are dealing with him, he is gracious and compassionate. When you cry in the book of Isaiah, when the children of Israel, even if they messed up in the Egypt, in the wilderness, Isaiah says, I think 64 or 65, when I cried with them as the angel of the Lord, he cried with them even in their mess. When you see people suffering, whether it's disasters, accidents, it moves God. You know why? Because he created us. God is merciful because of, we need to develop, at least if you, if you don't like what Jonah did, I don't like what he did. But at least confess with him, I knew that you are what? A gracious God, compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Okay? And then the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Verse 4. But then the Bible says, the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plan, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern what? For the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than what? 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And also, God even is compassionate to animals. Hallelujah. You know, in these last days, I have to say something here. I had someone say, the church has loved the Great Commission very well. In the Old Testament, Israel was the light of the world. Everyone went to Israel. If you wanted to follow God, you went to Israel. Then Jesus said, now go to the next nations. Now, in the kingdom age, what is God going to teach the church? To deal with creation. Start, start practicing to deal with cats nicely. Me, I don't like cats. Because I'm just, just a God. But the Lord challenged me. Even God is concerned with animals. Be kind. You never know they'll save you from an earthquake. Be kind. You know, this is a discipleship issue, my friend. Start getting used to relating well to creation. Creation is not the problem. Romans says it's the sin we put on creation that makes them up. So the Bible says creation is waiting for redemption. Why? When the sons of God came. So that we can relate to them in the right way. There's nothing wrong. I read a, a story in, in Job. I do those scriptures I read. I said, and Job says, I think 31, 30. He says in that verse, if I have made my land cry tears, may the land be not be productive. There's a scripture like that. So I went and read this scripture. I looked at another Bible. Job was so righteous, he treated the land well, that it became productive. He says you can make the land cry. There's a scripture. Please inbox me, I'll show you. I was like, so even the land cries because of how we treat it. And that's why drought comes, issues come because we have not treated the land very well. So another benefit, number five, okay? It, benefits, it motivates us to love God and obey his commands. Exodus 26 says, but showing love what? To a thousand generations of those who love me and what? Keep my commandments. Uh, let me repeat this. This verse, this verse, we got this revelation when I was in LIA. One time we were praying for a very difficult case from our director at that time. And hey, when we were praying, you know, there are these things you are fighting in your family, they never end. So when we read that scripture, the Lord just prompted this scripture and we shared with the, our team at that time. We have Exodus 20 says that for those who commit idolatry and all these things, God will judge them up to which generation? Third or fourth generation. But to those who love me, we do what? And bless them to what? And the Lord challenged us in that meeting earlier. Are we willing to live in a such a way in love and obedience that the Lord will bless a thousand generations of us? It is possible. What does he feel? Amen. So don't live for yourself. Live for your future generation. Don't be like Ezekiah. Me, I'll be okay in my time. My children are dissolved. You don't go like that. I want you to know, sometimes we, because you're the forerunners, maybe you're the first one to be born again in your family, you have these challenges, you're always fighting, you're always fighting, but I live. One day the Lord is saying, I've seen your righteousness. 
I'm coming to visit your generation. But if you look at the Bible, that is the pattern. God told Israel, I'm doing this because of Abraham. Then one time he told them, to the kings, I'm doing this because of David. The people may be messed up, but the Lord will say, I will remember the sacrifice of this family to someone. Live right, follow God, keep his commandments for the sake of your children. Praise the Lord. Number six, it motivates us to be patient and persevering when you are pasted through suffering. So knowing the God, God, the glory of God in his name. This scripture also really blessed me, okay? Because I was going through the book of Job. James 5, 7, 10 to 11 says, Be patient with bro them brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally what? Brought about. For the Lord is what? Full of compassion and mercy. The reason the Lord returned, uh, he had seven daughters, I think three sons. The Bible says he returned double plus his wealth because the Lord is full of what? Compassion and mercy. God did not want to see Job die with a lot of brokenness. He decided to return double. We had not having children. He had 14 now. Okay? But the Lord still returned it. You know, I haven't read the Bible that I like reading the Bible. This is the lady was complaining, cast God, cast God. Okay? Hallelujah. <laughs> God did not return another wife. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but with the same lady, he got how many children? 14. Ten. Seven. Seven. Ten. Because he said he returned double. Ten. The last time. Before with that, before he seen how many children he didn't have. Ten. And after that? Ten. So your children are not double. Yes. Double because in heaven they are the ten <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but at least the animals I counted they were double. You know what? Because he's full of compassion or what? You know, let me say like this, you know, you have seen people have gone who have lost children for many reasons. The Lord is full of compassion. He's able to say, okay, I will return this. Or someone who has been buried like Hannah in the Bible. God says, okay, give me my Samuel. How many children did he give Hannah? Five. Around five. five. Yes. So God says, I'm full of compassion. I've seen your tears. So I'm going to give you many children. I remember there's this man of God called Chuck Pierce. His wife was buried. Okay. We are like biographies. You like the preaching. We are like the biographies. I want to know what made this man. His wife was totally barren. So he prayed, prayed. One, one day, many years, the Lord opened her home. That's why Chuck Pierce has never practiced birth control. Do you know how many children he has? Almost 10. He told people, I look for children. Now when I get, now I have. And all of them have been raised. One of them is a prophet, by the way, in Israel. That's how God is full of what? Compassion and mercy. Let me tell you, God is moved by our suffering. He was moved by the suffering of Job. But Job never did. It was a test that God had committed himself to make sure Job must pass. So do not let our pain, our suffering, think that God doesn't love you. Just around the corner, like these prophets, the Lord will do what? Show you full compassion and mercy. Then finally, this one is what really blessed me most. It motivates us to align with God by putting on his character. So let me say something the Lord showed me, okay? Because this was like the third part. In 2021, you know, we're in this class of Matthew Sonship, so you know, we ask questions. So the Lord started showing me, when Jesus said, I'm the vine, and you're the branches, that is part, you must be under a type of baptism of union, because God is giving you his life. All you need to do is hang on the branch and the life will flow through you. Okay? So then I remember I had gone to God, I had gone to a garden of the Lord. The Lord told me this thing is the Bible. Then the next thing he showed me, remember when Jesus says, My brothers, my sisters, and my mother, are those who do what? They will. So that's another divine alignment. So you have divine life, but also you have divine will. That's why submission, that song they sound, it is very important. Please don't fight God. If you fight God, you will never align. And I always tell people, God is not here to implement your issues as good as they are. God is interested to implement what? His will. 
So what he does, all the struggles you do discipleship, the flesh, the world, the Lord is trying to align you so that I do my will. All of us have good desires, but I guarantee some of them are not from the Lord. Some of you are to be the richest people in the world. Did God call you that? Answer please, please answer me. God never called you to be the richest person in the world. God called you to be the most obedient person. Jesus said, Father, my body have given to you. It's written on me the scroll that I do your will. That's all. All these other things, if we seek the kingdom of God, he will add. But it should never be the negotiating point. Hallelujah. It should never, because once we confuse, how will you align, how will you go through the baptism of union, and the will of God is not your will? How? Tell me. And then the Lord told me, this is the third part. The third part, his character must become your character. Because some of us, the reason the will of God is not fulfilling, your character is fighting him. So when God looks in your life, like Micah 6, he says what? He has shown you, O mortal man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you to act what? Justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. God has to see these things in my life. I have to be just. I have to be merciful and have to walk in humility. Then he says in Zechariah 7 9, this is what the Lord Almighty said, administer what? True justice, show mercy and what? Compassion to one another. Matthew 23 verse 23, woe unto you hypocrites, eh? teachers of the law and prophet Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of what? Your spices. That is meat, dill and cumin, but you have neglected what? The more important what? matters of the law, which is what? Justice, mercy and faithfulness. Is he not called quoting Moses? Yeah. God wants to see, Jesus one time told his disciples, I desire to see mercy instead of sacrifice. That those things you should pray, they become part of our life. Now the justice, I'm talking about the justice of God. Now let me disclaim that the justice of God is not the Kenya government justice. Okay, the justice of God, the word justice in the Bible means to walk in the straight parts of the law. In every one of your life, that is justice. It's not attacking your enemies. Sorry. If you check the word Sedek, righteous, it means to walk in these paths. That's what's called a righteous man. It's nothing to do with going to court and fighting people. You know, Kenya has gone the street, we need our justice. I only say, which one? Do you know, if by the time you read on the street justice, God is wandering in heaven. And what about the widows in Kenya? What about the refugees? Don't think they need justice also. If I come down on behalf of widows, offers and refugees, I'll ban Kenya. So that's why God has answer those things. Because it's like we really don't care for his heart. Okay? We, we, we don't care what God cares about. I want to encourage you, pray. One of the mistakes the Pharisees and teachers of the law are hypocrites. This is one reason. The other reason is Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus told people, unless your righteousness is greater than what? The righteousness of Pharisees, you cannot survive my kingdom. What was he saying? Pharisees were not practicing what they taught. We have to practice what we teach if you're going to be greater than a Pharisee. And these guys were giving tithes. So tell your neighbor, tithes is not enough. <laughs> Don't go and attack God. God, I gave 20,000. The Lord is wondering, but where is your justice? Where is your mercy? Where is your compassion? Where is your love? The Lord said, you, I cannot answer this until I see this in your life. Okay? God is not here to pamper us. Hallelujah. Then the last one I really like, it says, therefore, as God's chosen people, what? Holy and dearly love. Clothe yourself with what? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We see at least three of those things Moses was told. Compassion, kindness is grace, and mercy and patience. God has to see this thing in our lives. Then, and only then, can we touch his heart. Okay? So I want us to pray. Okay? I went very quickly because of time. I want us to stand up, okay? There's a scripture, the Lord showed me how to respond. You know your situation, okay? I don't know what you're going through. There are things I've been praying for myself, especially this week. There's this time in the Bible, I have just read uh, Matthew 9, 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then Matthew 9, 27, you know the story. And Jesus went from there. Two blind men followed him, calling out. What did they say? 
have mercy on us, son of David. They were blind. Be specific. I don't know what you want mercy to be shown. I want to be very specific. Then another time, Matthew 15, 22, a Canaanite woman from the vicinity that is in Sidon came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. All these people, one was blind, one was demon-possessed. They came and cried out to Jesus, what? For mercy. And then the last one, Matthew 20, 30, it says, two blind men were sitting by the outside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, what? Have mercy on us. Have you noticed when you cry for mercy, you always cry to son of David, because son of David is a king. So I don't know your situation. I just want you to go to God. This situation, I'm bringing to you. Have mercy. This is the prayer that every time people cried out for mercy, Jesus stopped. He stopped everything. And make it specific. If you need school fees, tell God, have mercy. I need school fees. You need rent, whatever you need. You need to solve an issue in the relationship. Tell God, have mercy. Have mercy, son of David. This situation, I can't handle it. Can you pray? Father, we just want to come before you. We just want to thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself through your name. That you are the Lord, you are the Lord. Father, we praise you. That, Lord, you are compassionate, you are gracious, you are slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. You maintain love to thousands. And you always forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Father, we pray, we cry out to you that you have mercy upon us in the name of Jesus. You know our individual challenging situations. Father, we pray that you have mercy. We pray that you have mercy. We pray that you have mercy. We pray that you have mercy upon us, Lord. Son of David, we cry out you have mercy upon our families. Have mercy upon our children. Have mercy upon our country, Lord. Have mercy upon the body of Christ in the name of Jesus. Have mercy, O Lord. Have mercy, O Lord. Have mercy in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, have mercy upon our lives, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, do not deal with us according to our sin, but deal with us according, Lord, to your mercy and grace in the name of Jesus. So we cry out for your compassion, Lord. We cry out for mercy, Lord. We cry out for grace. You have said in your word that we shall come to the throne of grace and mercy that we may receive grace to help us in time of our need. Father, we are a needy people, Lord. We come out to you, Lord, and say, have mercy upon us in the name of Jesus. Have mercy upon our nation. Have mercy upon the church of Jesus Christ. Have mercy upon our families, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Have mercy, Lord, upon our brothers and sisters, Lord. We call upon your name, Lord. We pray for mercy, Lord, for healing, Lord. We pray for mercy, for deliverance. We pray for mercy, for provision, Lord. We pray for mercy, for your protection, Lord. We ask you for your mercy, for your guidance and instruction in the name of Jesus Christ, O God. Father, we cry out for mercy, Lord. We cry out for mercy for those who are sick in hospitals. We cry out for mercy for those who are in bondage and need to be set free. In the name of Jesus, we cry out for mercy for those who need guidance and instruction, Lord. We pray for mercy, Lord. We cry out for mercy in the name of Jesus. In the Raboshe Rekatana Raboshe Rebeyata. Lord Jesus, we pray, have mercy upon us, Lord. Have mercy upon our families. Have mercy upon our children. Have mercy upon the body of Christ. Have mercy upon Jesus here. Have mercy upon the body of Christ worldwide in this season, Lord. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy. Have mercy upon us, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we cry out to you, Lord. Have mercy, Lord Jesus. Have mercy, Lord, Son of David. Have mercy, Son of David. Have mercy, Son of David. Upon our lives in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth.